Just a push. Got it up there. Yeah, I can do. Okay, thank you. Mm. Well, welcome to we're continuing our word study, and so we read to, for leading up tonight a little bit of Genesis and some of Exodus and some of First Kings. And some of those readings were kind of to bring together the stuff we talked about last week as well. And, um, but also lead us into this week. And we're going to keep talking a little more about creation. And we're going to get more into the weeds than we did before a little bit. So we're going to look at a li little more word study. And then we're also going to look a little bit on how do you look at the literary structure and what types of things can that tell us? within the Bible itself. And so some of you maybe have done this before, some of you maybe not, but we're gonna take especially the creation story as our beginning to look at that. And, um, and then we'll move forward from there. So, but first, are there any thoughts from last week's or thoughts you had um, over the last week on temples and creation or? Bible study in general. What was the general? I was not there last week and I didn't listen to the recording. What was the yeah. general thing on the king? So general thing was the, I, I read it. We were looking at the ways that um, the, the creation of the temples and the different words of temple, how it oh. moves from like is connected with dwelling. And sometimes the word for just a simple house is used for a temple. And sometimes it's more of a like a holy location. And so it kind of moves through and it changes as we go along um, looking at the meaning of what a temple is. And then there's still parallels with the way the temple is created. There's parallels between creation has three tiers and the temple has three tiers. So the temple ends up being a recreation of creation. Mm. And that whole theme, just like to dwell, is followed throughout the whole Bible. Right. Then the temple is also followed throughout the whole Bible. Oh, as well. okay. The idea of a temple. Yeah, and it moves us from um, the temple being a like a movable location to being a specific location to God being present in all places in the temple, being able to be in different places to the temple being within us. And ourselves actually be in the temple. The temple of your heart. Mm -hmm. Your body is a temple. Yes. <laughs> Any other thoughts or questions starting us off? Well, I just, this is just an observation. Can you hear me? I'm not yes. Sure. yes. Yes. Okay. That I, I I struggle with trying to appreciate this concept of God being in the temple when the temple is this one place. Getting into more of an Old Testament understanding, um, and so I'll be looking for help in just trying to appreciate that more. It seems such a foreign idea. Um, but it but it kept the Israelites, God and Israel, they did, they lived that way for centuries, many centuries. Um, and it drove a lot of things that happened at different times in the Old Testament. Uh, so uh, I I'll just be watching for that. And if you don't, and I am, not, and you can't be too obvious about pointing it out <laughs> as we go along, because I might not recognize, I might not recognize it. That's kind of a carryover. I'll just this is just a tiny vignette, but one, a, a professional job that I enjoyed very much in that life um, involved uh, meeting with special education directors of the of, of local units. And I had a revelatory experience when this director and I were reviewing a document and he was pointing out things to me that I did not recognize. 
even though I, I conceptually, I knew what they were and I knew that they were supposed to be in the document. And I hope I had presence of mind enough to ask him, will you show me in this document where these things are? And he said, oh, they're well, here and here. And here I'm going to myself, oh, I just didn't see it for what, and that gave me a renewed appreciating that identifying is a much harder thing than we give it credit for. Yeah. Thanks. Well, let's, let's start actually with looking at the temple um, and think about places where, have you ever experienced a place that seemed more holy than other places or more sacred than other places? And would anybody want to share maybe a place that comes to mind? I haven't thought of it in years, in years. But there was a, a very special place in one of the churches that I attended as a child that downstairs they had created a grotto. Uh, stones and water just gently falling. And there, there may have been images, uh, statues and things, but I was not aware of them. Uh, but it was a place of contemplation, meditation, and you could feel peace the minute you went into this special area. Uh, it just was imbued with a beautiful spirit you know it, it just like you could have come out of a hot sun headache the whole nine yards walk into this space and be relieved of that and just sit and not sit kneel that you needed to kneel um but it was It was very astounding. Uh, I don't, I, I can't think of, of words to tell you how special it was. And I, I hadn't thought of that in years. But yeah, that was a very sacred, special place. Maryvale, mm -hmm. outside, mm -hmm. on the walk. That's a very special place as well. Mm -hmm. You go around that thing 15 times mm -hmm. and discover something brand new every mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. When when Mary first started talking, I this is not quite the answer, but thinking of the temple, you know, thinking of it as one building, you know, and I, I've thought about that a lot because <coughs> like I'm always talking about this, but the church I left, um, the building was really important, you know, um, couldn't have a wedding outside. You had to have a wedding inside the church or even more lately, the liturgy has to be inside the church, um, which makes you think about why, why the building was so important. You know, it's just mm -hmm. probably another factor I didn't quite get. Um, so yeah, I hadn't even thought of, so you started talking Mary about the importance of a building and why, what would make something like that holy and and would god can god be constrained in walls you know kind of thing but of course we have churches in every faith or places of worship so there is something to mm -hmm. something to the walls or something that holds community my place where i think i see god is um anywhere where anything i think Joyful and multicultural is happening. I was at the Bismarck at maybe, this maybe four weeks ago or something, and there was really good music. And I, I was helping my friends, the Amiris from Afghanistan, sell their their food. And uh, my friend from African Nomad was there, and the weather was gorgeous. And I definitely just felt that sort of God moment, just standing there watching the music and the running kids. And and I feel that way at any kind of global mm -hmm. event now that I think back on it. So, yeah. I think for me, it was a chapel in the scout camp area where uh, it was actually out in the woods. Uh, we had 
ecumenical services there, but even outside of the services, you could come sit. And it was always peaceful. And it just felt like that there's a load taken off your shoulders. It was always very relaxing uh, and peaceful, quiet. And I mean, it was, it wasn't really a building. It was just basically out in the woods, but the trees surrounding it made it look almost like a church that you walked into and the trees. And I just remember the seats weren't comfortable, but you, you didn't feel that, that too badly. It wasn't that bad. Yeah. You could sit there for a long time and just feel very peaceful. Pilgrim Park had an area and I don't remember what the seating was. I know it was just dirt, but I, it couldn't have been just dirt. But um, it definitely was not anything man-made. And there was a huge cross made out of a big tree and limbs. Oh. And you felt very, very you, at peace when you were there. At least I did. It was it was it was wonderful listening to birds and mm. seeing the squirrels scatter and chipmunks and it was just it was just very special. So the concept of a temple started with these types of stories, where you have stories of where people have experienced thin places, it's called in Celtic yeah. spirituality, yes. or places where they're experiencing the holy. And so even before the idea of there being actual buildings for a temple, there were these stories that people were experiencing. And what would happen is sometimes certain places had just an individual story where an individual felt connected because of their personal spirituality. And then other times there were places where communities would feel connected. And it would be a community experience where you'd feel this kind of thin place where there's sacred location. In the old, early Old Testament, you also see a lot of mention about trees and specific types of trees. And the belief is that there, these used to be actual sacred sites um, early on mm -hmm. before Judaism even established itself as a faith. Mm -hmm. You had these like oak trees up on the mount, up on the hillsides that would be sacred sites that people would go to and that's where they would experience the sacred as a community and as individuals. So they already had in their imagination that there are these sacred sites where they would go. And then it, while to develop moving towards the temple, what they did was, well, let's create these sites so that we have them with us. And that was the movable temple that they created the Ark of the Covenant. So they created a sacred site that could actually be moved with them. And then once they became more um, settled people and more of an agricultural um, type of people, then they're not migrating as much. They're not moving as much. So then they said, let's create a temple, like a place where we can come and we designate it as a community that this would be the sacred place. So, like architecturally and as far as the history of migration of people, um, temples in history probably also came about as people started to live in certain locations and were not as mobile. Otherwise their temples would have been more mobile. Um, so that's like the, the history side of where you get the concept of a temple building. Um, and then you've got the spiritual side that we looked at where the they had this concept and Mary, it's not bad that like it doesn't make sense to you because actually <laughs> it shouldn't make as much sense <clears throat> to you anymore because our understanding of God has changed so much from then. And so they moved from God is like a being or into God travels with us mm -hmm. to, but outside of us mm -hmm. to God is in stays in a certain location, which is why the building was important. And you can visit God when you go into that place mm -hmm. to God is um, with us all the time and around us and with within us that we experience the spirit. Mm -hmm. And in that, even our very bodies, our temples is where Christianity is now, which is why it can be hard to imagine God only being present in a one building location or a temple location, because the New Testament doesn't teach that. That's not what we've 
even learned or grown up with, mm -hmm. um, with our understanding of spirituality. Thank you. Thanks everybody for the contributions. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing your sacred places. So we're going to, so we started a bit with, and the temple remembering is structured after creation. So we're going to go back to the creation story again. We're going to keep going back to the creation story because creation stories are incredibly important within religion. Creation stories, um, they actually frame our understanding of the world. They create our foundation for what comes after. And what we believe about God is what allows us to assign meaning to things. Mm -hmm. And that's what creation stories in part are exploring. What do we believe about God? Mm -hmm. The creation story in the Old Testament is not created in a vacuum, though. There's a lot of overlap between the um, Judeo-Christian creation story and the Egyptian creation story. Mm -hmm. Both of them start mm -hmm. with chaos. Mm -hmm. And there are waters. And the waters are separated. In some of the Egyptian stories, the waters are being separated by gods, all of which are named after different parts of creation. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so as you listen to it, sometimes it sounds a lot like the creation story mm -hmm. that we have mm -hmm. um, in the Bible. You have the Babylonian creation yeah. story. Is that is that? T yep, and that's oh, the that's waters. Pretty, oh, that's pretty gruesome. <laughs> they, they, they. I'm leaving out gruesome parts here. <laughs> <laughs> but the Babylonian creation story, you have the sweet waters and the salt waters, mm -hmm. and they have mixed together, and, and that's where the world comes out of, mm -hmm. and, um, and then it gets super bloody. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but as you move through different creations, <coughs> area, water is so important, mm -hmm. and the waters rise, yeah. and remembering the, the Nile was also a river that would flood Mm -hmm. um, periodically, mm -hmm. and right. it would flood the whole land. And so it makes sense that you would have these creation stories in mm -hmm. which water was water really very important. important. Plus, yeah. water is important just for life itself. Mm -hmm. Every culture, water is important to human beings. Mm -hmm. Either the lack thereof or too much, or stories of cycles of too much or too little is often part of creation stories. So we've got these stories and they're assigning, helping us frame our understanding. They're helping us um, understand what we believe about God and assigning meaning. So in these creation stories then become repeated throughout scripture in different ways. Mm -hmm. And so we have, um, we're gonna look at creation, the creation story, how it's echoed in different parts of creation, different parts of the Bible. But first we'll look at the word for God so we have these two different creation stories. Um, the first one, the seven day one, and the next one um, brought out of the dirt. And mm -hmm. there's two different words. These different stories actually use a different word for God in each one. The first one predominantly used the word Elohim. Mm -hmm. And the second one uses the word Yahweh. And in your Bibles, usually they do that indicate the difference between these two in your Bible. Yeah. Whenever you see the word God, often, not always, but often that's the Elohim or some deriv derivative mm -hmm. of Elohim. If you see the word Lord, where Lord is in all caps, then that is usually Yahweh. Um, I don't know how the inclusive Bible. Mine says, you know, W, H, oh, it just W, H, Yahweh in. Yeah, without, you know. Yeah. Yep. And so God. some Bibles will actually just spell out the Hebrew word for God. Some will put just the letters because remembering Hebrew right. is spelled only with the consonants. The ancient yep. word is the Hebrew. And, um, so we've got Elohim is a plural um, word for God, a sign masculine as from the Strong's Concordance. And but within this word God, Elohim, um, there's another word. So no, Elohim is a plural Hebrew word. So it's actually like gods when we mm -hmm. see that in the first creation, mm -hmm. the gods mm -hmm. create it is, um, but it's often understood as being singular. Um, but there's another word related to it, Elo Eloah, and that 
L E L O A H. Hmm. And this one is a singular word for God. Also assigned masculine by Strong's Concordance. We're going to go back to the yeah, mine gender says, oh, piece. Oh, that's feminine. Yeah, yeah we're going to okay. go back. Okay, there. got it. <laughs> and um, I feel like something I studied, but I can't remember. Enough. Okay, yeah. continue. And then there's also the word L, E L, is another mm. word, singular word for God, masculine, yes, that's right. um, assigned for, by the Strong's Concordance. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've got these different words for God, all of which are translated into our Bibles, usually just as G-O-D oh. is how they're translated. Well, so okay. when you see the word God, it might be translated, unless you have a Hebrew like interlinear Bible that you're reading from where you can check, it may be from Elohim, it may be Eloah, it may be El that it's using, any of those words if it says God. Um What's interesting about these words, and you'll see in some newer Bibles, it sounds like Hannah's points this out too, that Elo, the sound ah and et in Hebrew usually indicate feminine words if they're at the end. So ah and et. In Eloah, um, ends in what would normally be considered a Hebrew feminine noun. And so some people are now questioning was this actually translated correctly or has it been misgendered in Hebrew? And that it should actually be that Eloah is actually like goddess, not a masculine god. And so that's something to think about. And I some um, also think that Elohim, the plural, is actually indicated both female and masculine, feminine and masculine attributes because it's plural holding both the L, the masculine, in the Elo Eloa, the feminine pieces, and that it's um, even beyond gender too. And some sit, would say maybe a non-gendered plural. Um, so these are, it's an interesting piece to look look into, especially because the, does anybody know what the oldest book in the Bible is? What we think is the oldest, not the first book written down, Job, yeah. Job uses Elohim and it uses Eloah more than any like any other book. Most of instances of Eloah are actually found in Job. Wow. Yeah. And it uses El and it uses Yahweh sometimes, but um, the narrator uses Yahweh. God doesn't really use Yahweh in the closing statement to reference to God's self, um, which is interesting. He uses like Elohim or Mm -hmm. Eloa or L. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's uh, interesting just as far as are there feminine attributes to God even within Hebrew itself? Um, maybe as far as like the way that the words are being would be gendered within Hebrew itself. We also have within L. So L just means God and it could mean any type of God. So it's just God. And so it could be, it could be talking about one of the Egyptians' gods and saying they're not, don't follow this God, don't follow that God, don't follow the gods of other things. What it, about um, El Shaddai? Yeah. So then you take mm -hmm. this word God and you're adding an adjective to it. So like El Shaddai would be, you're at putting that together, which would mean like almighty God is how it's usually translated in the Bible. Oh, okay. It's also God of the mountains, but the better translation should die actually relates more closely with breasts. The many breasts. The many breasted <laughs> God is a better, probably a better translation. Oh, I, El I did a deep dive into that one. Time. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> Maybe you should share some. <laughs> no. you know yeah. yeah, no, that's, that's the main thing. Yeah. It's mountains or many breasted god which gives it a sort of a female twist and yeah it makes that whole song by amy grant have a different meaning for me, you know? <laughs> it does <laughs> also most places where el shaddai is used in the bible it's talking about fertility yeah and so the that mm -hmm. name itself is mostly just used like when talking with abraham and sarah and having children talking with people who um are looking hoping to have children or the many nations coming out of them requiring reproduction then you get El Shaddai okay. so 
whenever you see Almighty God, it's probably translated from El Shaddai. Okay. And you could reasonably replace it with the words many breasted God or God of breasts or God of the mountains. Um, right. And, <coughs> wow. Okay. There's uh, many other words for God. You have El um, Olam and that is like everlasting God mm -hmm. or literally mm -hmm. God of a long hidden time period of which there's no beginning or end. <laughs> Something mm -hmm. like that. How do you spell that? At o -L -M. <laughs> I don't know. But that's usually translated into English as everlasting God. Mm -hmm. So if you see the term everlasting God, mm -hmm. there's a different, it's the L mm -hmm. with the adjective attached to it. Mm -hmm. um, there's also like uh, this is the phone. Can we there. answer? You can answer. answer. Here. Yeah. There's also El Gibor, um, G I B B O R, and that's Mighty God, is what yeah, that go that would be. Hello. So we've got, and there's there's more. There's so many different more. So if when you read the Bible and you're hearing the reading like these adjectives with God, know that they're also referencing to different names of God, not just putting an adjective on to God as well. Excuse me just one moment. Excuse me for just one moment. Hello? Can you hear me? We get some Spanish calls in the house. Um, <laughs> They want to give us some pre defibrillators and they'll tell us how much. <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's usually the time of span calls. Yeah. Um, so we've got we've got these different names. So mm -hmm. in the first story, we've got Elohim, probably predominantly used, or the derivatives of that. Mm -hmm. And then the second creation story, we have Yahweh. So we're gonna jump into Genesis six through nine. But first, any questions about about those? I always associated Elohim with God of the Mountains. Uh, that's incorrect. No, Elohim is just gods, or God in the plural, although it's usually understood and translated as singular. And then L-O-A is related to that, E-L-O-A-H. And you can sometimes find it in your Bibles as you look in the notes in the bottom of your Bibles. Sometimes it will translate Almighty God at the bottom where it has it in the little footnotes mm -hmm. to tell you what is the actual Hebrew name for God mm -hmm. um, that it's pointing to? Mm -hmm. It doesn't do it for everything. Usually, the, at least the first time it occurs in the Bible, it'll say it in the bottom of your notes. So, I mean, finding the first time it says that name of God in the Bible is sometimes tricky, um, but um, then you will usually say it in your footnotes. So if we go to Genesis, Six through nine, chapter six to nine. This is the story of Noah. We talked about the story of Noah with the Conquerans last Sunday. And um, I think they were surprised to realize how depressed Noah was <laughs> after he got off the boat. Mm. and um, realized all his friends were no longer living. So as we follow through, we're not going to read all of this, but we've got, starting in chapter six, we read about the wickedness of humankind. And, um, and then starting in chapter six, verse nine, it tells us, these are the descendants of Noah. Noah's, Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. So every time it says God, remember it's Elohim, or derivative of Elohim, it's being said. So we have God there. 
Then we jump ahead a little bit. We go to 6, 12, not far ahead. So verse 12. And God saw that the earth was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth. And throughout this whole section, it's using the word Elohim in Hebrew. Then we get to chapter 7, 7, 1. And it says, then the Lord said to Noah, then the Lord, so it's changing what Hebrew word is being used here. It's using Yahweh now in Hebrew. Yeah. So we're, we're within a single story, but it's changing uh, the name for God. And it seems to be doing it very intentionally. So we've got Noah walked with God. God saw the world was corrupt. Then the, yeah, Yahweh said to Noah. And then we see, continued in this section, 7-5. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. And Noah did all that Yahweh had commanded him. Then we move forward into 7, 9. 2 and 2. Male and female went into the ark with Noah. As God had, as Elohim had commanded Noah. You're in Exodus chapter 7? Genesis, Genesis. chapter Thank 7. Thank you. <laughs> You're different events in Exodus occurring. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Huh. So we're going back and forth here. Never noticed that. And, um, and it continues to go back and forth. 7 um, verse 16a. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as Elohim had commanded him. And... Yahweh shut him. all in one sentence. All in one, all sentence. In one sentence. That's so, true. Yeah. So we're going back and forth, and um, and then we get a, going forward. Seven twenty-two. Everything on dry land, in whose nostrils was the breath of life, died. And then we'll go kind of listen to the story. Now we're going to keep going back and forth. We get to 8, chapter 8, verse 1. But Elohim remembered Noah and all the wild animals and all the domestic animals that were with him in the ark. And Elohim made a wind blow over the earth, and the water subsided. And the fountains of and the windows of the heavens were closed, and the rains from the heavens was restrained, and the waters gradually receded from the earth. And at the end of 150 days, the water had abated. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. Does any of this sound kind of familiar to the creation story? Yeah. So we start it with, there was God in the beginning. God with us. And um, we're, we're walking almost backwards. So God's with humankind and God looks and sees the corruption. And so then God walks it back and with male and female. Now we're back in creation to um, humankind being created, a reference back to that. And then we're walking backwards through creation further. Now humankind, the breath of life has been removed from humankind. That like even the breath of life is now. And then we walk forward again back through creation so everything's been destroyed it was created now creation's being reversed in noah and then the winds blow separating the waters from the waters the land comes out and in the seventh month like the seventh day they came to rest um, and so we have this creation story occurring again mm -hmm. But they're also weaving together both creation stories in Genesis. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. weaving together the one that uses Elohim, mm -hmm. and they're weaving together the one that uses Yahweh. Mm -hmm. And they're telling you that and pointing it out, kind of the literary mastery of it is by using those different names of God mm -hmm. to um, make your jog your memory to those stories of Elohim and Yahweh in those two different stories. And then we continue on. So we've got, um, then Noah built an altar 
to Yahweh. Yahweh smelled the pleasing odor. And Elohim blessed Noah. This is in chapter 9, mm -hmm. 9 1. Elohim blessed Noah, be fruitful and multiply. And then 9 6. For in his own image, Elohim made humankind. And we have creation completing to the place where creation, the story of creation, stopped in Genesis. Mm -hmm. And there's other stories that do the same thing, but Noah is kind of like the new creation story that's occurring. There's even a new covenant that's happening with this. And um, we had, there's even different things you can eat. You've got the first creation stories and everybody's can be a vegetarian. Noah's mm -hmm. story, now they can eat meat like and vegetables, mm -hmm. that it actually changes um, what types of things people can consume even and how they're in relationship with the earth, with one another. Um, Gretchen, yes. in my book, I just have, I have the revised standard and it's just God and Lord. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So mm -hmm. where it says Lord, that's being translated from Yahweh in yeah, Hebrew. Yeah, I think. Yeah. But my question is, they, it continues to use God and Lord throughout the Bible. So does, does this say, continue yes. when it says Lord to be Yahweh? And when it's God, it's... Halloween. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So any of the Old Testament, that is usually a standard when it's being translated from Hebrew is Elohim or the derivative of Elohim is um, being used, translated into English as G-O-D, God, usually with a capital letter. Sometimes L is translated as God with a lowercase g because it's talking about other gods. Um, and but Yahweh is like the proper personal name for God, which is in why in Hebrew you don't even say the name. And, and so that one is translated as the Lord in all caps. So it, and it's, if it's being translated, it will have Lord in all caps. So if you see Lord not in all caps, and the Bible is not translating it from Elohim. It's actually probably translating it from another word that means something like, like a like King. a lord of a kingdom King, or yeah. Um, yeah something a master or something like that. Yeah. Other thoughts or questions? Do you think these are? Um, mishmashes like the story of Noah of quite a few different renditions? I think so. There's so, so almost every, like a lot of the Bible, <laughs> or um, some of the Old Testament. Well, you mean like culturally or you mean stories within the Bible itself? I mean, no, probably stories from the time that were written and maybe just put together. Yeah, so from that time period in this part of the world where we're located, right. almost every culture has a flood story. Mm -hmm. And a creation story. And a creation story. Mm -hmm. But the flood story is particularly interesting because ev every culture has a creation story, but not every culture has a flood story that's mm -hmm. so similar to one another. But this particular location, they all have flood stories. So I think for sure there was a huge flood in people's history that completely devastated the entire Everything. area. Yeah, mine and, says may have been the end of the ice age or maybe a different yeah. flood. Or and yeah. so in every culture assigned different meanings to it, which is why then they describe but it. But do you think the writer here, whoever put this together, was probably using all these sources? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> okay. I don't know. I mean, with the different, um, you know, saying Yahweh here, and you know, they were taking a piece of this story, and then God mm -hmm. here, so they just took mm -hmm. a piece of another story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, they were for sure oral tradition first. So why, why else would you keep switching like that? Right, and but then they would have been written down later. Mm -hmm. so right, the that's true. Who were doing the oral that's tradition. True. The, the people who were doing the writing would have known all of the oral tradition. Mm -hmm. So then they probably reworded it 
so that it would flow better together and yeah, it that's, to true. that's true they also would have known other cultures but because by the time it's oh, being yeah. written down yeah. they've already experienced and come into contact with so many other cultures probably mm-hmm. already been into exile and places right the time some true. of it's been written that's true huh interesting so I think they absolutely influence each other. Well, yeah. <laughs> How could you not, I guess? Right. But, and the idea of authorship wasn't as important. So. Uh, no. Hmm. Well, let's go back to Genesis. So we're going to look at the first story of Genesis. And we're going to look at some literary structure within Genesis. The creation story? Creation story. Genesis 1. The first so we've got these, as we begin this story, um, we begin kind of with a, like a summary statement. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, then um, in that, in Hebrew, this is exactly seven words. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, or the skies and the land, as um, we talked about. And then the next verse, we get um, like a, an explanation, a further description of it. Now the the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. And we're introduced to these words of like chaos or, um, and these words of abyss and these words of water. Um, in this first area. And and then we kind of follow <coughs> moving from bless you. Thank this you. wilderness and uninhabited um, into the creation of the world. And so we have in day one, the light is called day and there's light. Day two, <coughs> you get a sky in a dome in the waters that creates the earth. Day three, dry land emerges from the waters. So one is light, two is waters, and and day three is land. Then we get into these day four, five, and six. And day four, remember day one was light. Day four starts with light two, and we talk about light. Day two, which started with sky dome in the waters, Day five correlates with that, and it talks about sky and water creatures. Mm-hmm. We get birds mm-hmm. and the creatures mm-hmm. of the water. Mm-hmm. Then we move into the day six. Day three, remember, was about dry land. And day six, we get land creatures. Oh, yeah. mm. And so we have these parallels that are moving through the days that if you created a chart, um, you would could see, okay, day one and four, we've got lights. Day two and five, We've got sky and waters. First, the creation of it, and then the um, living portion of it in the next portion. But in the beginning, we have water and earth. Yes. So, but But they're always there. Water and earth are there at the very beginning. So, heavens and earth have many different understandings in Hebrew, Mm -hmm. especially heavens. So heavens means water, heavens means high above, heavens means, um, is tied with many different things Mm -hmm. in earth too. And that's part of why Genesis, once we start breaking it down, it's so confusing because we have waters already in creation, Mm -hmm. but then there's like the creation of like waters too. And there's light and then there's the sun and the moon and right and we have the earth Mm -hmm. but then there's like the creation Creation of of land yes whereas yeah the Mm -hmm. earth Mm -hmm. early on doesn't necessarily mean land itself Mm -hmm. um but so then it it is confusing as we walk through it because of that because there's so many different meanings and we're getting plays on words in hebrew which are not translating into English. Yeah, I was wondering where were the waters were, you know, where where, where was separation, what was... Yeah, I, is there a... I, there's a whiteboard here. Oh, yeah. Because it just says it, swept, it sweeps over the face of the water. So this is what's happening. 
in this story. We have, there's waters, okay? Mm -hmm. So we have waters. There's waters below and there's waters above. And what's happening- But what's creation, above? How, could, how do you have an above? Waters. It's okay. all the heavens. It's the heavens. Okay. There's heaven everywhere. It's just chaos and everything's everywhere. Okay. And what happens in the creation story, and, and this is also what happens in the um, Egyptian creation story and in illustrations of the Babylonian creation story um, are similar too. Didn't use blue. Just be really that with water so much. Is that there's these waters and then God creates a dome. Mm -hmm. That dome separates the waters from the waters. So what happens is that now that God has created this dome, now we have the waters which are like the seas and the oceans. And we have the waters up here in another under translation of the word waters in Hebrew is the heavens, the skies. So now we have the sky. Because remember, if you don't know, um, understand atmosphere, the way we understand atmosphere, why does it rain? There must be water above the dome. And there must be windows in this dome that let the water in. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is when it rains, the windows, God opens the windows in the dome and the waters come in. And so the only way it rains is when God opens the windows. And so if you don't open windows, water doesn't come in. And so they're explaining too, why is it raining? And, and you're, um, also, you're also creating finite spaces. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hey, Gretchen, why is he creating light twice? Once on day one and then the day four again. Is it different type of light and dark? Is it more of the spirit of light, uh, truth as the light? And when on day four, it's more the physical light? So day one, there is like, there's light, let there be light. And God saw the light was good and God separates the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness God called night. Right. And there's evening and first day. Day four, um, and God said, that, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them be signs and for seasons and for days and years and let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. So if you think of that illustration, the very crudely drawn illustration of this, um, we have before the domes even created, God has created light. And so there's the concept of light and there's the concept of darkness, but there's no sun not been created. Right. There's no moon not been created. Day four is when the sun and the moon, now we already have a dome. So you actually have a place where you can put the sun and you have a place where you can put the moon um, and the stars. So there's light and darkness before there is actually a sun or a moon. Um, we, <laughs> understand, like, we understand that light comes from the sun and the moon's reflecting that, but that might was not obviously the understanding in the way the world is created in this story. Yeah, but you, you need the light from the sun to make the vegetation that was created on day three. Right. Right, but that's, uh, God didn't need it, I guess. There was light. <laughs> but, but in Genesis, this is still a person that is thinking this up and trying to figure out how it all works. It's yeah. not God. It's it's still the the way a person looks at it. Right. So and so he's telling it the way a person might think of how God would do it. All of creation falls within the genre, the literary genre of mythology. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes people, when they hear that, think about it as like, that means it carries no truth, which yeah. is really like a very new concept of understanding mythology. Oh. Um, myth is something that which carries 
so much truth and carries truth about the world that cannot be expressed by facts. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, so that's what's being said yeah. here. So it's not terrible. The, the, um, it, this is not a history lesson. <laughs> and this is not a science lesson and it's not factual no. in that way that we think about a history or science mm -hmm. book mm -hmm. um, but it's very true in how they're ex it's expressing where's god in the midst of this mm -hmm. what's the role of humanity and what's the role of creation so that we can lay our foundation to build life off of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because life is about much more than facts <laughs> really <laughs> and i just i don't know if i've ever read this before but in my notes i just think it's interesting that in the beginning um, a lot of translators feel that's not a time but a process so mm -hmm. at the beginning of god's creating rather than in any kind of beginning mm. i thought oh it's a process that's interesting yeah but then you start thinking so linear the beginning the end uh, i brought the message just for fun oh okay and my first and second verses are first this god created the heavens and earth all you see all you don't see earth was a soup of nothingness a bottomless emptiness as inky blackness god's spirit brooded like a bird above the watery abyss um, oh yeah that i guess mine's a weird yeah. yeah it uh well we can't comprehend this stuff we we, we don't no. have the ability to comprehend infinity you know um we want to right. put boxes around it and then you say yep. but what's on the other side we just mm -hmm. it's just not doesn't seem possible yeah and i think that's part of it is that the Hebrew scriptures are also meant to be read in a meditative way where you would read them and they're not intended to be fully comprehended upon one reading, mm -hmm. not even upon 50 readings, mm -hmm. that you're supposed to read it, sit with it, read it, sit with it, read it, sit with it, or hear it orally is even better um, and, ha and sit with it. And then each time you hear something different. Mm -hmm. And that that's part of how we stimulate our faith as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's meant to stimulate our imaginations and creativity too. Because um, it talks about, I mean, to create all of this from chaos and nothings, that's incredible creative power. And, um, and we're being created in the image of God. And so part of the story is also to bring to mind those things within ourselves, those things that we have been created in the image of, using mm -hmm. this incredible creativity and, um, and power as well. Mm -hmm. So now that we made Genesis more confusing, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which was sort of the goal of right now um, um as we go on genesis this first part of genesis um again and again some of the hebrew sentences are seven words each like that's something that's happening regularly in this section is that they're really emphasizing seven throughout this entire piece um what was the first seven was that including in the beginning in Hebrew, yeah, seven, in Hebrew. Yeah. but it was including in the beginning all the way through. Yeah, Earth. in the okay. beginning, God created the skies and the land where the heavens and the earth. Okay, that was the first seven. Yep. And then towards the end, as we go into the summary, and God completed on the seventh day God's work, work which He had done. That's seven words. Uh, and God rested on the seventh day from His work which He had done. That's seven words. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because on it. He rested from all his work, which God created to do. That's seven words. We heard it in Hebrew at our Bible study. Do you remember that, Camille? January 8th, 21. I dated it. 
Brian write, <laughs> reads in Hebrew, so, <laughs> but I was not looking for the seven moves. This it's incredible to hear in Hebrew. Yeah, mm -hmm. he he does oh, that for us. Yes, yeah. and um, yes, and especially if you ever do study Hebrew, usually Genesis is the first part that you mm -hmm. read. And once you like read it and understand it, it's just like kind of exhilarating because you're like, hmm. mm -hmm. this it's it's so poetic and it's so mm -hmm. um, it sounds so different. In so Hebrew. you could probably Google that and maybe find some yeah. somebody reading on YouTube or something. I suppose yeah. Mm -hmm. Just to yeah, hear the it first too. the book, first book is not named Genesis. It's named in the beginning. Right. You see that in my notes. Mm -hmm. So. I know we're at seven, but I've got no. something else about sevens that I want to get to. Oh, at <laughs> seven here. Very nice. Um, so I want to show this. I'm going to share my screen. There's no sound with it. There we go. So this is a little handout here, and it comes from the Bible Project, but it shows where these sevens are continuing to repeat. Mm -hmm. So as we saw, not only it was Noah and other stories taking the words of God, Elohim, and Yahweh, and creating parallels, and creating parallels in the content. But we have also have parallels in the numbers that are being done. Mm -hmm. And um, so we have Genesis, the seven days. Then we get it in the tabernacle, too. Whenever we go back to the temple, mm -hmm. we see there's seven speeches. There's um, seven acts that are being done with the completion, with Jerusalem's temple. Um, there's seven petitions that are being done and we go through and this repetition that occurs always within sevens when it's talking about um, especially temple and relating it back to creation happens again and again to call us back to that memory of the creation stories over and over and reminding us of that foundation so i want to just show you that we won't walk through all of it you actually read some of this though you read Exodus 40, and you read um, mm -hmm. the King's piece as well. Mm -hmm. So you did read these sevens. Um, did you catch them when mm -hmm. you did the reading? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. <laughs> the seven yeah. I wasn't reading it. <laughs> seven, seven, seven. Well, this one isn't no. the Hebrew words seven. number seven. So it's the number of it's times that things happen. Yeah, no. Are you going to put this in? Seven email. times seven. I can put it in email. Yeah, seven which I'm times. 77. So yeah, it I continues right into the that. New Testament. Yeah. I'll actually, I'll send this whole thing. This is, it's from the Bible Project, and it talks more about um, the temple and then has part of what we talked about tonight mm -hmm. on there, too, with the mm -hmm. chart of mm -hmm. Genesis. And it goes a little deeper than mm -hmm. you I'd, as well. I'd be interested in that. Mm -hmm. So any... Right. Gretchen, yes. excuse me for interrupting. Before we close, I want to warn you and everybody else. I'm sitting here, and for some reason, my computer did something really clever. It went different, and it said recording on Gretchen's recording, and there's a bunch of glibby lines and stuff. So if you go back and watch the recording, heaven knows where this came from or what it was, and I apologize, because I wasn't messing with my computer. But anyway, that I just want to warn you that that shows up. All right. But, and then well, no, I know Goblin here. <laughs> hey, I warn well, you. <laughs> Halloween's <laughs> coming. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah, Halloween's coming really. yeah. Sorry about that. Maybe it didn't no, happen I, really. I think it's, sure, I'm sure it's fine. Yeah. yeah. Well, if it shows up, you'll know who was guilty. <laughs> here, not me, the computer. <laughs> <clears throat> thank you any, yes thank you any last thoughts reflections that was a lot to take in yeah. uh, I learned a lot this evening of stuff that I must have read hundreds of times before mm -hmm. and it, it's really neat to discover something new again mm -hmm. that's great that's great yeah, and each time you go deeper, especially when you add new layers of language, mm -hmm. um, you can go even deeper and mm -hmm. it just becomes really fascinating because mm -hmm. there's things you don't even realize about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. It would be nice to know Hebrew and read it in Hebrew. 
<laughs> automatically. It would be so hard to learn it. Brian took a, a really in-depth class. You might want to ask him where, where he uh, he studies. But I'm just no, I just I'm just thinking it would be interesting to because you know we all I was very close to Norwegian grandparents and they spoke Norwegian all the time and all my aunts and uncles and it would just be nice to know because the words do change when you translate them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's we another way. We have a friend who learned Hebrew and he's now a rabbi. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what were you going to say, Gretchen? Yeah. Um, so, biblical Hebrew, if you learn Hebrew and want to read the Bible, look for biblical Hebrew um, because modern day Hebrew is different than biblical Hebrew. And so, actually, you can't be conversational okay. in biblical Hebrew. Because we don't know exactly mm -hmm. how it's pronounced. It's mm -hmm. just a written language at this mm -hmm. point. Right? Oh, okay. and, and so I, won't be, I don't have enough life left to read <laughs> Hebrew. And remembering when you're looking at Hebrew, if you do just, um, you can also look at interlinear Bibles where you would, um, it shows the Hebrew words, but then it says right under them, the words in English. So that's one way you can kind of read in Hebrew oh. without actually needing to know yeah. Hebrew. We're Do we starting. have one of those at our church? Um, what's that called? An a... interlinear Hebrew English Bible. I'd, I'd have are, to. Look. Are there enough English words to describe all the stuff in Hebrew? So sometimes it's like a really long with a bunch of dashes in between oh, English okay. words, <laughs> and it's one word in Hebrew, and then it has it like in dashes. Then it's kind of broken it up. Um, but. There's also, you can look at like a Hebrew dictionary. Maybe next week I'll bring some Hebrew resources so you okay. can see what types of resources there are for Hebrew. Um, when, um, when people, Jewish, Jewish people do like their bar mitzvah and stuff, would that be, and they do the reading in Hebrew, yeah. that would be biblical Hebrew? That would be biblical, biblical. Hebrew. So they, they, I mean, they learn that, mm -hmm. on how much they retain, you know, mm -hmm. Jesus' team and then don't mm -hmm. follow up. But. Huh. Yeah. So normally, if you're reading from that, you'd be reading from the scroll and you have a little pointer to help you follow because Hebrew is also read from the right to left. And so to remember oh, that, yeah. that makes reading an interlinear Bible just a heads up a little right more difficult because you're reading from right to left. Like all Even though it's being translated into English underneath, you read from right to left. Manga novels the kids read. And then, <laughs> those are right to left. Yeah. And then you have, there's the suffixes and prefixes, but the interlinear kind of breaks it down. That's some of the dashes, if it's a D or what type of pronouns are being used or plurals or mm -hmm. ends of sentences, whatever that might be. Um, but I'll bring some resources next time. And what is Yiddish then? Is that, um, that incorporates Hebrew or something? I don't know much about Yiddish. Oh, I don't know. Probably. I thought just I had to it's go probably a slang. A modern, Hebrew background. Yeah, it's probably slang. a slang. A Hebrew, yeah. maybe. Modern slang, yeah. It's like uh, my sister so we had, like, going to week. Italy. She was studying Italian so that she could, you know, uh, understand and, and converse in Italian. And my mother was talking to her and just burst out laughing and she said there isn't anybody in Italy that will not be able to understand you because you are learning Roman Italian oh he said but it's just like the Bronx versus uh mm -hmm. southern um uh, South Carolina versus Tennessee versus mm -hmm. Kentucky so the the dialects the uh different um they're going to change. They're going to be very different. Mm -hmm. You won't be able to understand them. <laughs> Interesting. But, yeah. Homework for next week um, is actually not reading homework. Homework for next week is to reflect on some personal encounter that you've had um, with a different culture and um, in which you had some miscommunication or confusion that was experienced. Say that you write that to us. Um, yep, yeah, I'll write it. So think of a an experience with a different culture in which there was miscommunication. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs>
And um, and so and so we'll get into another approach for towards words next week. And I've got a question for you too. Um, there's one piece I think it'd be helpful for us to understand Jewish history a little bit more. And so I found a video that's um, it puts Jewish history down, boils it down to one hour, which means it's missing a lot. But um, and. <laughs> question that I have for you is if you'd rather watch it by yourselves or if you'd rather just do it as a group and take an hour together and watch it. What would be the preference? I'd rather do it as a group and watch it. That way we can discuss it. Okay. I would too. Okay. Then, then we'll do that. I don't know for that. Um, I don't think we'll be able to record it. I think there might be some copyright stuff. So okay. when we do that, I'll send out the link, and if you want to watch it together, we'll just watch it together at the church. And okay. if you want to watch it on your on your own, you can just watch the video on your own. Well, just I, tell us when you're going to do it ahead of time, because I I'll just come to church. Yes, I think it'll be in like two weeks. Okay. Good. Sounds good. So maybe we can make some popcorn and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> We ought to have I can Toby. bring popcorn. Yeah, we yeah. have Toby there we bring go. Popcorn. the popcorn. Toby yeah. can bring popcorn in two weeks. And <laughs> <laughs> we'll watch this this clip. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Really, really enjoying this this study. Mm -hmm. Good. Good to know.